What distinguishes socially engaged art from actual social work? This is a fairly simple question that often comes up around projects of art for social change. The answer, however, is not quite so straightforward. This question essentially revolves around the idea of singularity. In other words, what constitutes the art of art for social change? How are these social practices somehow different? What is the quality that singles them out as artistic work? Common responses to this question typically revolve around socially engaged art's criticality and at times ethical challenge. However, non-art activist practices also have the capability of producing critical content. Meanwhile, not all socially engaged art is ethically contentious or provokes reflexive distance. Therefore, these characteristics cannot really be said to effectively distinguish social practices as a whole from non-art interventions. In contrast to these common views, I want to propose a different answer to this question by focusing on art's artificiality. Before doing so, however, it's worth pointing out that this issue of singularity is not exclusive to socially engaged practices, though it is more immediately striking there. In reality, it concerns all of contemporary art, which is in fact ontologically and artistically identical to everyday life. In his book, Comte After Duchamp, Thierry Dudeuve demonstrates how the ready-made generates a new condition for art, what we know as contemporary art, by eliminating any objective determination, any criterion that might enable us to distinguish art from non-art. In other words, with the appearance of the ready-made, art becomes indeterminate. If you think of Duchamp's fountain, for instance, it is both art and not art at the same time, just a regular old manufactured urinal. For lack of a criterion that might allow us to definitively say that this sculpture is art and this manufactured toilet isn't, all that we're left with is our own subjective judgment our personal intuitive feeling when we encounter a work that inspires us to declare that, ah, this is art, or this is an art, it's a piece of crap. This judgment is dissensual in nature. It entails disagreement because in the absence of any objective criterion deciding the matter one way or another, different people will almost certainly disagree on whether this monochrome painting or that naked performance is art. That being said, while contemporary art as a whole has become indeterminate, the question of singularity is more immediately apparent with social practices. The reason being that these practices surpass another aspect typically associated with art, namely its autonomy or lack of functionality. Instead, social practices champion art's potential utility, its usefulness. Advocates of art for social change, like curator Nato Thompson, are no longer so concerned with whether something is art, and perhaps rightly so, since it appears that it is now up to everyone to individually decide. Instead, they are much more interested in whether a practice is useful. In this vein, artist Tanya Bruguera, for instance, has called to put Duchamp's fountain, the quintessential ready-made, back into the restroom where it might be put to good use. Thus, socially engaged art shifts the matter of singularity to a question of use. Now, there are two different ways in which this move from singularity to use might be interpreted. These two conflicting readings essentially come down to art's artificiality. The first interpretation is to read this move as an attempt to reintroduce a criterion to evaluate art over and against its inherent indeterminacy. Leaving aside whether or not usefulness is an adequate measure, the point is that instead of a public reception that's based on a subjective judgment, this is art or this isn't art, this move can be understood as a demand that we evaluate instead the work's objective effects, assess what's actual, what the work is actually doing. Basically, this interpretation amounts to instrumentalizing art. It holds the work to task in relation to its claims on the basis of a certain standard. In contrast, the second possible interpretation of this shift from singularity to use corresponds to a further move in the direction of what Suhail Malik has called contemporary art's anarcho-realist maxim.
What this maxim refers to is a certain idealist tendency in contemporary art that aims to overcome art's artificiality in order to directly engage with the real. It aims to surpass art's artifice in order to generate an art that is more social, more collaborative, more real, an art that intervenes directly into the social fabric beyond the institution. In Malik's words, an art that is effectively political, a genuinely public art. This anarcho-realist maxim is in fact a residual trace of the avant-garde in contemporary art that aims to avoid capture mechanisms. In other words, to escape institutional structures that might instrumentalize the work. So if we think about this shift from singularity to use in relation to art's artificiality, the first interpretation of this move corresponds to a reinstitutionalization of artistic practice by establishing a criterion to evaluate the work, and this move instrumentalizes art. By contrast, the second interpretation corresponds to an escape from the institution and its instrumentalizing mechanisms in order to engage with the real on its own terms. In general, the discourse around art for social change tends to favor this second interpretation. In fact, in his anthology, Living as Farm, Nato Thompson dismisses the difference between socially engaged projects and social work. He deliberately chooses to include examples of both rather than draw a distinction between artistic and non-artistic practices. This decision suggests that Thompson rejects art's artificiality in a bid for more real, more engaged art that intervenes on equal footing with activism and social work. This tack is also apparent in Tanya Bergera's concept of useful art. In her text, Reflections on Arte Utile, Bruguera suggests that the distinction between useful social practices and social work lies in art's ability to create and to implement a project that does not exist in a context where the necessary conditions are not automatically in place. She writes, the sense of Arte Utile is to imagine, create, develop, and implement something that produced in artistic practice, offers the people a clearly beneficial result. It is art because it is the elaboration of a proposal that does not yet exist in the real world, and because it is made with the hope and belief that something may be done better, even when the conditions for it to happen may not be there yet. Here, creativity, or the art of socially engaged art, is identified as inventiveness, as the ability to imagine and implement change in the form of a feasible utopia. It is social because it operates in the civic. It takes place outside of its own institutions. Now, Bruguera's text does suggest the makings of an instrumental conception of art by invalidating the prospect of failure. Basically, if a project fails, then it's not useful art. However, she ultimately remains committed to a withdrawal from art's institutional condition into the real. She states, all art is useful, yes, but the usefulness we are talking about is the immersion of art directly into society with all our resources. We have to enter people's houses, people's lives. This is where useful art is. If we think about Bruguera's claim in relation to our initial question, what distinguishes socially engaged art from social work, inventiveness and imagination don't really provide an answer because they're not exclusive to the arts. This type of creative maneuvering also characterizes strategies deployed by a number of non-art social groups and organizations, which is exactly why Thompson chooses to include both in his anthology of Art for Social Change. What in fact distinguishes non-art groups and organizations from artists, curators, and artistic collectives are the resources at each one's disposal. Art practitioners benefit from particular structures of visibility, legitimization, and critique, as well as the privileged access and immunity afforded by the art world. While Bruguera willingly mobilizes these resources, she also simultaneously distances herself from their modalities. Useful art is defined in relation to a concrete action that forgoes artifice in favor of a direct involvement in society.
Arte Utile refuses art's indexical dimension to embrace a result-oriented approach, an approach that is designed to ensure art's public service in the form of a direct intervention in the civic. But as much as Bruguera may affirm that Arte Utile functions directly with, in, reality, it always remains in art from the perspective of art, thus the ideality of this kind of exit strategy. To sum up, if we come back to this move away from art singularity in the direction of art's usefulness, while Thompson and Bruguera's account aim to evaluate art's effectiveness in the face of its inherent indeterminacy, both deliberately forgo its artificial dimension. Their respective positions further undo art's distinctive artfulness, its artifice, for the purpose of effectively acting upon the real. But in doing so, they abandon the possibility of establishing use as a criterion more globally by forgoing the particular mechanisms through which art institutes. The special capability of art to institute in culture, as culture, in other words, the distinct capacity of art, both artworks and its distribution networks, to stabilize meaning and value, not only distinguishes it from social work, it can also guarantee a wider, more solid, and long-lasting impact for social practices. In contrast, by forgoing art's artificiality, the anarcho-realist move inadvertently perpetuates the framework and mechanisms by which power reproduces and expands in the cultural field. But before going into more detail, it's important first to understand why socially engaged practices tend towards this anarcho-realist maxim. In other words, why proponents of art for social change strive to distance themselves from art's artificiality and to exit art institutions. Simply put, artifice is typically associated with spectacle, whereas art institutions are perceived as a context that depoliticizes art. In brief, the rationale behind numerous social practices turned towards life is grounded in Guy Debord's seminal book, The Society of the Spectacle. In it, Debord argues that the spectacle has become the dominant model for social life. He defines the spectacle as a social relationship between people that is mediated by images. According to Debord, all that once was directly lived has become mere representation. With this in mind, a number of artistic practices from the 1970s onwards come to gradually reject art's artificiality, understood as representation, to immerse their work in life as part of a project to repair the social bond. Meanwhile, art's institutionality, which is in every way tied to its artificiality, is seen as the site where hegemonic power absorbs and neutralizes critique. In this respect, we can think of renowned sociologist Pierre Bourdieu, who warns that art institutions, in their hermeneutic presentation, recode practice as discourse. He argues that they reduce social relations to communicative re relations and, more precisely, to decoding operations. More recently, Jérôme Glichenstein has suggested that institutions contribute to art's lack of traction. He describes how museums can depoliticize artworks the moment they are sanctioned by focusing on an extreme example of transgressive art involving an illegal action. He examines Hervé Paraponiaris' work, Tout ce que je vous ai volé, which entailed stealing objects from people's homes and exhibiting them in the museum. Glichenstein uses this example to argue that in order to avoid censorship, art institution will function as heterotopic entities removed from society. These entities ensure the visibility of even the most transgressive acts by transforming their illegal action into a symbolic critique, thereby granting artists a degree of immunity. Given this state of affairs, as Nato Thompson puts it, getting out of the museum or gallery and into the public can often come from an artist's belief or concern that the designated space for representation takes the teeth out of a work. Today, perhaps more than ever, artists and curators are very much aware that the visibility networks, funding sources, and legitimacy structures that are associated with the art world are highly susceptible to hegemonic power.
Power does not only proliferate in spite of, but rather under the guise of critical content and constructive social interventions. It is well known, for instance, that critical content generally inflates a work's price tag rather than making it immune to financial speculation. Thompson acknowledges this problem. He promotes socially engaged art's symbolic dimension in the face of the often limited scope of their actual concrete effects. But he also concedes that this symbolic aspect can be made to support conflicting interests. He writes, socially engaged art can easily be used at, as advertising for vast structures of power from governments to corporations. But that doesn't mean that artistic institutions should be dismantled and abandoned altogether. By forgoing art's artificiality in favor of the real, curators and artists remain stuck with the problem of the symbolic as an indeterminacy that opens art up to dominant power. Against it, good intentions and concrete implementation are not enough to block the work from being recuperated by interests that are foreign to its claims. Beyond intent and execution, these works need backing by more official structures capable of guaranteeing the significance of their processes and outcomes long term. In order to be effective, socially engaged art can't solely rely on sustained sociality and concrete implementation in the real. It's not enough that they perform a tangible action with beneficial social effects. Such actions also need to be aimed at a more just institutionalization, which requires stabilizing meaning and values. In the absence of an institutional structure capable of securing their value and semantic charge, artworks are too easily recuperated. As Thompson noted, they risk unwanted co-option as vehicles for the proliferation of power. Now, if we return to our initial question, the proposition here, based on Malik's argument, is that contrary to the anarcho-realist tendency in contemporary art, which insists on social intervention, implementation, and ongoing collectivity, what might give more traction to socially engaged art and simultaneously distinguish it from social work is instead an affirmation of its artifice. For according to Malik, affirming artificiality can give art a negative power of judgment. It can enable the construction of new criteria to negate causes of indignation beyond dissensus, beyond mere disagreement. What Malik argues is that from the moment art absorbed its own negation, this avant-garde abolishment of all criteria differentiating it from non-art, Contemporary art has undertaken a systematic critique of institutions. It has continuously destabilized the criteria for their enduring semantic security. But while this critique has proven necessary and justified, art has failed in the process to replace unjust institutions with more just entities. Instead, contemporary art has normalized this kind of continuous deregulatory mechanism, which has led to this idealist desire to escape into the real. For Malik, affirming art's artificiality and institutional condition is a way to stabilize meaning so as to formulate an effective negation of specific instances of injustice. By contrast, any escape into the real that renounces art's artifice basically forgoes the institution that underwrites the condition for its intervention. To illustrate this, we can think of speech acts. For instance, the act of marriage is underwritten or secured by an institution, the institution of marriage, without which the words I do are semantically indeterminate and stripped of all effect. They can mean anything like, I do like you, or I do think this ceremony is cool, and they no longer affect a change in the status of the person saying the words from single to married. In contrast to approaches that promote a more real implementation, Malik argues in favor of instrumentalizing art without escaping its institutional dimension. In sum, it's no wonder that social practices are continuously met with the questions, is this art? or how is this different from social work, uh, given their continued attempts at immersion into the real?
But these renewed efforts have in fact further opened social practices up to the type of co-option they're forever trying to evade through their super-idealization of the real. In effect, as Malik demonstrates, the real of art is in fact its artificiality its status as an institutional practice embedded in a set of power dynamics that can be affirmed or negated once acknowledged without recourse to dissensual judgment. By providing criteria and semantic stability, as sociologist Luke Boltanski remarks, institutions inscribe into reality. They make non-existing being real. If we return to Bruguera's claim, a moment of inventiveness in art is not one that imagines and implements change. Instead, I would argue, like Malik, that it is one that constructs the identification, understanding, and negation of causes of indignation to insurrectionary effect. Importantly, this can only be done through work that acknowledges its inherent artificial and institutional condition without fetishizing the present. Thus, beyond moments of good civic contributions, beyond the production of alt socialities, the transfer of skill sets, and so on, socially engaged art should also endeavor to do what art does best as an artificial and institutional practice, that is, to fix sense and provide value in order to hold to account. In this way, Beyond its concrete projects, these social practices might also serve as a model of commitment and an instrument of accountability, putting all of us to task. <laughs>